Today, a family brutally slaughtered. Police say Penny Cathy and her 8 and 13 year old sons were shot and stabbed multiple times before dying. The house was then set on fire. Police have arrested a 16 year old daughter. She has told a lot of different stories about what happened the night that they were murdered. But today, we're going to try to find out the truth. A Dr. Phil exclusive. They practically decapitate your mother, shoot and stab your brothers to death. Her plan was to have the entire family murdered. So what was Erin's reaction when she learned that her father had actually survived the brutal attack? I was shot 11 times. These are bullet wounds in your father's body. Have you seen these? This is where they shot him in the face. But is her father in denial? You know that she planned this, right? How do you transition from the daughter that everybody would dream of to planning the death of your family? For the first time, the daughter speaks out. You needed them out of the way for a reason. What was it? It will go down as one of the most disturbing and senseless murders in Texas history. In the early morning hours of March 1st, 2008, a family is woken out of their sleep and are brutally and savagely murdered by two intruders armed with a 22 pistol and a samurai sword. The mother nearly decapitated the father shot multiple times, the 13-year-old son shot in the face, and the youngest victim, an innocent 8-year-old boy, stabbed three times in the back of his neck and left to die after the home was set on fire. Now, who would commit such a crime? What did they want? What could possibly be the motive? Well, one thing they never expected is that one of their victims would survive gunshots to the head and body and be able to crawl out of that fire and point the finger. An attack on a Range County family left a mother and her two sons dead and a father in the hospital. The victims were found in a burning house near Emory, 60 miles east of Dallas. The couple's daughter may have played a role in the crime. It was early Saturday morning when father and husband Terry Cathy crawled to his neighbor's house after being shot. Police say Penny Cathy and her 8 and 13 year old sons were shot and stabbed multiple times before dying. The house was then set on fire. They were some of the best people I ever knew. In custody are 18 year old Bobby Johnson, 20 year old Charles Wade and 19 year old Charles Wilkinson. He's the boyfriend of 16 year old Erin Cathy. She's the victim's daughter and has also been arrested. Each face is three counts of capital murder. According to court documents, Wilkinson confessed to police that, quote, he and Aaron were in love and the only way they could be together is to kill the parents. Wilkinson allegedly offered Wade $2,000 to help. Those kids were just dolls. And even that little girl, we thought was precious. Well, as we heard, Terry Caffey miraculously survived the brutal and bloody attack on his family. Now listen as this father recounts the night that destroyed his family and changed his life forever. I went to bed that night around midnight. I heard barking. We had a black lab, Max. He quit barking after a few moments, and I didn't hear another sound at all until... 3 a.m. I'd wake to the sound of our door slamming up against the wall. I could see the silhouette of, of someone standing over us. Immediately, gun blasts begin to go off. I'm starting to scream, Penny screaming. We're being riddled with gunfire. I'm getting hit. And I remember throwing my body over Penny, trying to protect her. I took several shots in the chest and took a blast in the face. And then that shot blew me out of bed. I'm laying down in a pool of blood, and I'm trying to speak, but I can't. And I could hear heavy breathing, somebody standing over me, and I could hear the reloading of the gun. I was uh, shot 11 times. I could hear my wife screaming, saying, where's Terry, where's Terry? I would hear the voice of the killers. He told her, why don't you just die? He put the, the sword that he had to her throat and he rammed it in and he slit her, nearly decapitating her. And every time she'd take a breath, I could hear the gurgling of the 
blood come out of her neck. And now I can hear my boy screaming out. I could hear footsteps going upstairs to my children. <sighs> my 13-year-old son, Matthew, he began to cry out, no, Charlie, no, please don't do this. Why are you doing this? And for the very first time, I realized Aaron's boyfriend, Charlie, was the killer. And I really began to panic. I can't save her, but I can get, I gotta get to my children. But I'm trying to get up, and I'm just slipping them on blood. Matthew was shot in the head and in the back of the neck. They went into the next room, which was Aaron's room, and Tyler was hiding in the closet. And they took these, this samurai sword, and they each took turns stabbing Tyler to death. I'm assuming at this point that even Aaron was dead, and I just collapsed face down. I remember waking up, and I felt real hot. I realized that the house was on fire. I'm choking on blood and smoke, and as I climbed over the bed trying to get away from those flames, that's when I landed on the floor beside Penny. And just to see what I saw was just, can't even put it into words. I had just witnessed the murders of my family. I knew I needed to get help and get to my neighbors, but they lived about 400 yards away. I'm on my belly, and I'm literally just dragging my body like that. At, at some points, I would find trees, and I'd pull myself up, hold on, and I would take one or two steps, and I would collapse and fall face down in the dirt. I said, God, just let me make it to my neighbors. I got to identify the killers. The door slings open, and there's Tommy Gaston, my neighbor, looking down at me, and he just has this look of shock on his face. I said, Penny and the boys are gone. Charlie did it. Charlie did it. Well, within hours, the police had tracked Charlie down. It wasn't long before his accomplices were revealed. Charlie Wilkinson was found within just an hour or two of the murders, laying on a mattress in the back of Charles Wade's brother's trailer. They noticed a pistol laying right by his hand, which turned out to be the murder weapon. There were bullets and ammunition found. They were about to let Charlie put his boots on and there were what appeared to be blood droplets on the boots. They took him in to custody right then. After the detectives took Charlie in to be questioned, they went and asked for a search warrant and got it to go back in to search for evidence. And one of the officers was looking through piles of clothing and he came across what he thought was a large stuffed animal. And when he touched the hair, he realized it was a human being and that was Aaron Caffey. Aaron was found under a pile of clothing by a closet in one of the back rooms of the trailer, laying in a fetal position. She appeared to be disoriented and she said, where am I? When officers attempted to ask her questions, they, all she said was fire. Before I was rushed into surgery, my sister came to me and told me that my daughter Erin was alive. I heard that I had something to live for. The belief was that she was a victim. And so she was taken to the hospital for a sexual assault examination. One of the most striking things about Erin is that she made reference to the fire in the house while she was in the house, but she did not smell of smoke at all. While Aaron was at the hospital, Charlie was at the sheriff's office being questioned by detectives. Very early, they informed him there had been a surviving victim and that he had been identified as being one of the shooters. He said that this had been Aaron's idea and that she had wanted her parents dead. He had suggested that Aaron just run away instead, but Aaron's response to all of this was no, just kill them. Eventually, he implicated Charles Wade and Bobby Johnson. Charlie told the officers that he had asked Charles Wade to help him and that he had promised him $2,000 and that Charles Wade was behind on child support, so he agreed to do it. Charlie told officers that Bobby Johnson was just along for the ride. Shortly after Charlie's interview concluded, officers went out to find both Charles Wade and Bobby Johnson. All three confessions matched up both Charles and Bobby in their confessions made reference to, as they were driving off, Aaron making a comment, holy that was awesome. After Aaron's examination at the hospital, she was released to her grandparents. The three of them were driving to the hospital to see Terry. There were officers escorting them. Those officers were radioed that Aaron had been implicated so they stopped the car and arrested Aaron right there on the side of the road. 
my sister said Aaron was in charge with murder. Any hope that I had for living had just left me. Because Aaron was a juvenile, she could not be interviewed. She was allowed to make a written statement. She said that men with swords dressed in ninja outfits had come into the home and kidnapped her by the evening of March 1st. All four of those involved were in custody and charged with capital murder. Terry, from the very beginning, was wanting to know uh, what the evidence was against Aaron. Lisa was showing me statements where classmates were saying that they overheard Aaron and Charlie plotting the murders of her family. It was awful. It was the hardest meeting I have ever, ever had as a prosecutor. The fact that these kids were all so brutal and so um, premeditated, that they were just so cavalier about human life, and that they were just so stupid about going about this. At the time, this was the most disturbing case I had ever seen. Well, Terry, the only survivor, uh, is here today. Uh, he's spoken to Aaron many times since the murders, and he says that he's forgiven her. But my question is, has he forgiven her for what she says she did, or has he forgiven her for what she really did? And those are two very different courses of events. Uh, we're going to have Terry come out now and, and join us. Terry, come on out. Terry, I'm, I, I'm really glad you're here, and I, I have to say a thing, a few things first, just father to father. Right. First off, I am so terribly sorry for your loss. You. And you know that last week I had the opportunity, with your support, thank right. you very much yeah. for that, mm -hmm. um, to sit down and talk to Aaron in prison. Uh, in Gatesville, Texas, yes. and this was the first time that she had really been subjected to any kind of cross-examination whatsoever. That's true. And I want you to hear what she had to say. Okay. Um, are Are you good with that? I'm, I'm good to go. I'd right. love to see this. And um, what is your greatest fear here? I guess my greatest fear is I don't want people to see Aaron as a monster. I want people to see the, the Aaron I knew before this, and hopefully they'll see the progress she's made. She's got a long ways to go yet. And, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I want to know that one time in, in your life, somebody that has talked to her and had the opportunity to ask some hard questions mm -hmm. has given you some honest input and honest feedback about this. Because if she is lying to you, mm -hmm. If she is minimizing, if she is trivializing mm -hmm. this, and you are choosing to believe that, she will never heal. Right. Because she will know in her heart, mm -hmm. I am lying to that man. I've never owned this. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's not the case, but we'll find out. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to take a quick break. Aaron, as I said, was never questioned by the police or on the stand at trial, a large part because she was a minor. And since the murder, she has told three totally different versions of what happened that night. She now admits two of those accounts were just outright lies and says the version she told her father is the truth. But is it? Coming up. Were you in love with Charlie? So this guy that you say you're kind of maybe sort of in love with just kills your whole family, then you have sex. What were you thinking and feeling about that? Wednesday on an all-new Dr. Phil. I've wired James around 265000 Does it bother you that you've never seen or met this guy? A mom hooked by a love scam. This guy's a fraud. There's cash cow. Is that him calling you right now? Yes, it's him. Oh, my God. You are a scumbag scam artist, and you're going to give this lady her money back. What do you think of that? That's Wednesday.
I'm in Gatesville, Texas today at the Hilltop Unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I'm getting ready to sit down and have an exclusive interview with Erin Caffey. She is serving life plus 25 years associated with a triple murder, the murder of her mother and her two younger brothers. She has told a lot of different stories about what happened the night that they were brutally murdered, but today we're going to try to find out the truth. Erin, I'm Dr. Sill. How are you? Why are you here? For the murders of my mother and two brothers. You pled guilty because you are guilty, is that correct? Yes, sir. What did you do that made you part of this murder? I knew about it and didn't say anything. Tell me how this all happened. I met Charlie and um, things were going good. My mother and father didn't really like him. Right. And, um... The first time he ever mentioned, you know, that he wanted to kill my parents was, you know, after Christmas, he had gave me a ring, proposed to me, and my parents, you know, didn't want us to. And it was a promise ring, not an engagement yes, ring, right? Yes, and you said that he brought up killing your parents, right? Yes. Why was that necessary in his mind? I don't know. I guess he said it out of anger the first time because... Me and my mom had gotten into a fight. So it was two months plus a little bit yes, sir. that this had been talked about. Yes, sir. Did at any time during that two months, did you say, well, wait a minute, when did we kill my parents? I really didn't think that he would follow through with it. I would just ask him questions like, how, I mean, how would you do that? You know, instead of just saying, whoa, 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 stop. Well, let's fast forward to that night. How does this go down on the night that it happened? We had talked at school that morning, and he said, you know, just let's, um, let's kill your parents. It will, you know, run away to Maine together, and everything will be okay. I'll call my friend, and I'll come pick you up at 12. And that night around 11.45, I knew he was out there, so I made a phone call. I said, you know, where are you at? And he said, well, hurry up and get out here and hung up. So I walked out the house and picked up my little dog Buddy and was petting him all the way to the end of the driveway. Before I knew it, there was a car that came and it was Bobby and Charles. All right, so you're outside and he says, I'm here to kill your parents, so what happened? I go to get in the car, um, you know, have no shoes on, no nothing, and he's griping at me for not having, you know, re being ready, you know, and not having my bags or anything. Then we drive down to like this run down church. We were trying to get out of it, oh, we'll just run away. But, you know, they kept begging me on about, you know, and I just guess it was like feeding into it. So did you finally say okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You finally said, okay, go, go kill my parents, my mother and my father. The woman that brought me into the world, people that have fed me and clothed me and housed me and loved me every day of my life, sure, go kill them. Yes, sir. Did you see weapons then? No, I didn't see weapons. How, how did you think they were going to kill them? Well, I knew they were in the back of the car because I heard slinging and banging. They were getting weapons? Yes. What did they do that was so bad that you were willing for them to be killed? Nothing. Did you think about the next morning my parents will be dead? You had two little brothers in the house. What was going to happen with them? I didn't really think about that too much. Did you think they were going to be killed? It crossed my mind, yes. So you're sitting in the car, and and this this guy says, we're going to go up there and massacre your family. Yes. And they, they get it done. So where did you go then? Back to the house where they used to stay at. What did you do? We just laid on the couch, and uh, Charlie wanted to have sex, and I told him no, and this guy came out from behind the house up in the back bedroom and Charlie handed him something and asked him to clean it and it was gun, it was wrapped. And the guy said, you know, we could go lay in his bedroom because he was leaving for work. And we go back there and I just wanted to just sleep and just not wake up. Did you have sex? Yeah. So your parents are murdered. Did they tell you that they killed your little brothers? When you knew they set the house on fire. I just looked back and I saw red coming out of the window and I 
I mean, put two and two together. Okay, were you in love with Charlie? Yeah. Sort of, kind of. I mean, you're, you don't seem very mm -hmm. passionate about it. So this guy that you say you're kind of maybe sort of in love with just kills your whole family, then you have sex. What were you thinking and feeling about that? Um, I didn't enjoy it. How would you feel about your family being dead? Uh, I didn't want to think. Coming up. Your father heard Charlie tell Penny, die, bitch, die. He slit her throat and started cutting her head off. Your father said that he heard your mother gurgling for air every time she took a breath. This February, get ready for unforgettable drama you won't see anywhere else. At age 19, I was married to the prophet of the FLDS people. This 85-year-old man who has 64 other wives. A former sect member confronts her polygamous father. My father condones my marriage. How does that make sense to a father to marry his daughter off to the crypt keeper? Stories that change lives. You had a hand to put in my son in jail possibly for life. Was this soldier falsely convicted? Have you ever made false allegations prior to this? Yes, I have. Is this father killing his child? You have an addict for a daughter and you're giving her money. Are you telling me that you don't know she's buying drugs with it? You took her to a drug house to get it. A community east of Dallas is still coping tonight with an attack that left a mother and her two sons dead and a father in the hospital. Police have arrested three teenagers for the crime, one of whom the family's 16-year-old daughter. But here's what we know from the forensic evidence. Charlie crept into your parents' bedroom and just started shooting them. They shot your mother in the head twice. These are bullet wounds in your father's body. Have you seen these? This is where they shot him in the face. This is where they shot him in, in the head. D did he do anything that you would consider deserving this? Your father, Terry, heard your mother say to Charlie, where is Terry? To which Charlie replied, quote, Terry is dead. Quit fighting this and it will go quick. And then he heard Charlie tell Penny, die, bitch, die. And then he took a samurai sword, he slit her throat and started cutting her head off. Did you know that's what happened? Your father said that he heard your mother gurgling for air every time she took a breath. Is that what you wanted to happen to them? You knew they were going in there to kill them, right? What did you think was going to happen? That they weren't really going to do it. You thought they would chicken out or something at the end? Your father said that he heard your brother Matthew say, Charlie, don't do this. Why are you doing this? And then there was a gunshot, and Matt said nothing else. Because as it turns out, he was shot in the face. Did you want your little brothers to be killed? Tyler was eight. You knew they stabbed him three times in the back of the neck, right? My dad told me. They decided to kill your little brothers because, quote, little ones talk. They didn't want any witnesses. Charlie said the little boys were really scared and he couldn't look at their faces. 
and Matthew tried to put up a fight by kicking him, and so Charles shot him in the face with a 22. Why did that happen? They practically decapitate your mother, they shoot your father, they shoot and stab your brothers to death and leave them to burn in the fire. I mean, what started the, the friction with your parents? Was it because they were trying to break you all up? Did you want to break up? Yeah. So you really didn't want to be with Charlie? Why not? The Wednesday before all this happened, um, my mom comes home and has Facebook or MySpace things saying he was talking to other girls and talking nasty about me to his friends. And I broke up with him that Wednesday. Within two days, he kept, you know, following me around at school and wouldn't stop. If you didn't want to be with him because he was flirting with other girls, why would it be necessary to kill your family then if you were breaking up with him? What's the point of him needing to do that? Because he wouldn't leave me alone. And, and I thought I was in love with him at the time, you know? I mean, looking back on it now, I know that I, it, I, it wasn't. It was just lust. Were your parents overprotective? Yeah. Because your family was described as, people say there's no such thing as a perfect family, but they said y'all were about as close as you could get. People at the church just loved you, that you were Miss Personality, you were bubbly and always happy to help anybody with anything. How did you go from that to being involved in a plot to massacre your family? Okay, what happened that she was that vulnerable to be led to such a, 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 a horrific act? Well, it's hard, difficult to watch this. You know, I, you know, none of this makes sense. And even to this day, it, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, it was senseless. You've got four young people and not one came forward to try to stop this. I think she just got in over her head. She began to make one bad choice after the other and she was trying to cover this up. I mean, look at this precious child. People said when she would sing in the choir, she would become so moved that she would cry sometimes during the songs. How did you talk to yourself about that in your mind about, how can we go from that mm -hmm. to her being involved in her little brother being stabbed in the back of the neck with a samurai sword and left to burn alive. And that's what makes no sense, you know. If I, if I was wrong some way, if we were wrong as parents, we, you know, tell us. But you have no answer for that. Right. You knew when she said, they said she got out her bedroom window, you knew that was a lie right. because there is a bolted yeah, had, air conditioner. Yeah, air condition bolted actually to the window frame, and I knew it would take a drill or something, uh, tools to remove that. So you knew that was so, right. So things were already, even though I was in the hospital in that condition, in shock, these things just, it just wasn't making sense. Next, the plan was to kill her entire family. So what was Erin's reaction when she learned there was a lone survivor? Coming up. Were you shocked to hear that your father survived? Mm, I was glad. Were you scared? Yes. Because your father surviving means he can now identify who the killers were. hours of the morning on March 1st, 2008, 16-year-old Aaron Caffey told her boyfriend Charlie and his hunting buddy Charles, just go do it. She was talking about murdering her family. Aaron has never talked publicly about the murders or what led up to them until now. In an exclusive interview, I asked her why she wanted her family dead and how she felt when she heard the news that her father had actually survived the brutal attack and was pointing the finger at her boyfriend. How do you transition from the daughter that everybody would dream of to sitting in a car plotting the death of your family? Every parent in America wants to know, what do we look for? How does this happen? I guess 
you know, Charlie was my first real boyfriend. Every girl my age, you know, talks about, you know, getting pregnant and having a family, and every girl wants that. And I guess I just thought I was grown. How does being grown become murder? You needed them out of the way for a reason. What was it? Was it a freedom thing? Maybe. Were you shocked to hear that your father survived? Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you heard that? Mm -hmm. I was glad. But were you scared? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you had said to the police you knew nothing about this, that you weren't involved in any way. And here is your father surviving, which means he can now identify who the killers were. You said to the police, I woke up in a house full of smoke and two guys with swords told me to lay face down and don't get up. Then they left the room I got the phone and I called my friend Charlie. Then the next thing I remember is waking up by the cops in that house and I don't know who it is or where I am. This is what you told the police that night. But now you learn that your father has survived. Were you more scared or more glad? I'm more scared. Because you thought, we're caught, right? Did you think you're still going to get out of it, you personally? Or did you think, oh boy, we're in trouble now? I was in trouble. You thought, yeah, we're in trouble now. Even now, as I sit with her in prison and ask her to reflect back, I said, when you found out he was alive, were you more glad or more scared? And she said, I was more scared. Mm -hmm. She was more scared than glad that you were alive. Mm -hmm. Because she said, I knew now I'm in trouble. You know, I see what, what she's saying here. She is glad I'm alive that she has a parent left, but I think she's also scared I'm busted. You know, I'm, I'm gonna, be, gonna be found out everything that I've done. Because at that point she knows mm -hmm. I can't lie about this and get away yeah. with well, it. Well, it's apparent they're covering stuff up. This has been going on for over a month that we find out that they've been discussing this. I asked her, why did you want your family dead? Was it because mm -hmm. of freedom? And she says, mm, yeah, maybe. Well, you know, certainly, Charlie's a sociopathic type personality. He was very controlling, always had to know where she was. He tried to isolate her from her family and friends. And I believe that, um, you know, he was convincing her that, you know, your parents are too strict. You just, you're, you're not, they're not allowed you have fun. You know, let's go out and have fun. Don't listen to them. They don't love you like I love you. And so she began to make one bad choice after the other. Having a girl controlled by a, a boyfriend is nothing new. Mm -hmm. But taking the steps to, to plan out to murder her mother and father and two little brothers, mm -hmm. that's a huge leap from, I love you, they don't. Let's go kill them all. Coming up. I understand that night you guys had just had a pillow fight. Right. You realize now, at the time she's doing that, she knows not one of you will ever see daylight again. Wednesday on an all-new Dr. Phil. I've wired James around 265000 Does it bother you that you've never seen or met this guy? A mom hooked by a love scam. This guy's a fraud. Here's Cash Cow. Is that him calling you right now? Yes, it's him. Oh, my God. You are a scumbag scam artist, and you're going to give this lady her money back. What do you think of that? That's Wednesday.
Let's talk about the night that this happened before it all happened. Mm -hmm. I understand that night was a pretty typical family night. In fact, you guys had just had a pillow fight. Right. Was she involved? She was. She seemed normal. There was nothing indicating that there was something wrong. You realize now, at the time she's doing that, she knows not one of you will ever see daylight again. And that's what's been hard for me to wrap my mind around because she seems so normal, so happy at that moment. She's laughing and playing yeah. and cutting up knowing you will be murdered within hours. 16 years old, does she really comprehend really what's about to take place? But you understand that's a pretty black and white thing. Mm -hmm. I've either got people coming here tonight to kill my family or I don't. Mm -hmm. And as we now know, this wasn't a spur of the moment anger sort of thing. Mm -hmm. she, she had planned, she had been involved in the planning of this. Right. That sounds to me astoundingly disconnect for her to be able to do that knowing what's going to happen but i think you've got the catalyst here of, of, of this teenage girl who has been making bad choice after bad choice a, a bad choice is missing curfew a, a bad choice is getting pregnant mm -hmm. but executing a plan to murder your entire family bad choice just doesn't seem like big enough words mm -hmm to wrap around that. When I went to interview her, not minutes after I was gone, she called you, did she not? Mm -hmm. And said, don't you go talk mm -hmm. to him. Don't you be involved with him because he's trying to make me out to be a monster and say that I'm the mastermind of this whole thing, correct? Correct, correct. So what she told you isn't true. Right. Did she characterize my interaction with her accurately? No. So it tells me she's continuing to try to do that. Also here today is the prosecutor on the case, Assistant Attorney General for the state of Texas, Lisa Tanner. Lisa, you've, you've never heard her question before. No, I have not. And I had limited time with her, but I hope I asked some questions that you wanted to hear the answers to. You did. Was she a passenger in this, or was she one of, if, if not the driving force behind it? I have to rely on the objective evidence. And as I've told Terry all along, that Aaron was, at a minimum, um, a co-driver of this. Now, when Charles Wade, Charlie Wilkinson, and we won't get, we'll get to Aaron in a minute, and Bobby, the other girl involved, were arrested, at that point, they've never spoken again, correct? They're, in, they're interrogated separately? They were each interrogated separately. Um, and each of the three of them fully confessed. And we went forward based on those confessions. Later, eight, nine, ten months later, when um, we worked out a plea agreement at Terry's request with Charles and Charlie, part of that plea agreement was that they agree to be fully debriefed. They were looking at the possibility of the death penalty. And Part of us offering them a life sentence was the contingency that they be absolutely truthful. Uh, we got to take a break. Up next, Erin is adamant that the story she told her father about the night her mother and brothers were brutally murdered is the truth. Well, you know, is it? We're going to find out more about what really happened that night and Erin's role in it based on facts and evidence when we come back. Coming up, what the killers revealed in their jailhouse confessions. John Killer Paris. Charlie, Charles, and Bobby all tell a similar story implicating Aaron as being the driving force here. Take a look. Um, originally she was supposed to keep the dog quiet. Okay, and she was supposed to keep the dog quiet. Well, she called back around 2 o'clock, right at 2 o'clock, and uh, says that she's out at the road to come pick her up and discuss what we're going to do. When you picked her up, did she have all her clothes with her in the bag and stuff she packed? It was okay. all packed still in the house? Okay, so she gets in the car with you and Charles and Bobby? 
I try to talk her to go back inside to get her stuff. Right. Looks like just go inside, get your stuff, and what little bit of money you have in that box, and then come inside. Okay. And then you can just run away. Everything will be all right that way. I think I'll be good now. I was trying to talk her out of it. Trying to talk her out of what? Changing her mind. Oh, what changing her mind doing? from what? Trying to kill her parents. Okay. What I don't understand, if she was real, if she hadn't, wasn't at this point not changing her mind or had any second thoughts, why wasn't she fully dressed, suitcase in hand, and ready to go? When she got in the car with those guys, she, oh, she, she was bare feet, pajama bottoms, t-shirts, like 39, 40 degrees, no bag at hand. She's telling me that she had changed her mind, went down and said, just go, we'll talk about this at school Monday, just go. As far as the dog barking, she said, I was afraid that you guys were going to wake up and find out what was going on. When you ask her about it uh, that night during a visit to the prison, she said that they just planned to run away. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if it was a plan to run away, then I'll ask you what you just asked me. Mm -hmm. If she was running away, why did she go out with no shoes and her pajamas and leave her bag inside? Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not denying her involvement, because I told her from the very beginning, Aaron, you just need to tell the truth no matter what that is, and we'll deal with it. And again, just whether she was planning on run away or murdering her family, they talked about both. But I'm just seeing her having second thoughts at this point. Coming up. You haven't told the truth yet, have you? What is the truth? Stop justifying your inactivity and avoiding the challenge of change. For help getting started, go to DrPhil.com for 11 seasons of advice, articles, and exclusive videos you won't find anywhere else. Plus, sign up for the Dr. Phil community to share your story and find support from others. All on DrPhil.com. This story is far from over. In fact, we have barely scratched the surface. So we're going to continue with this tomorrow. Here are just a few of the things we have yet to cover. Will Erin ever admit that she is, in fact, the mastermind behind the horrific murders of her family? Did Erin ask anyone else to kill her family? And what did Erin exclaim when she knew her family was dead? And will what Erin told me help Terry come to terms with the truth about his daughter? Take a look at some of the highlights from tomorrow's show. You haven't told the truth yet, have you? Tomorrow on Dr. Phil. What is the truth? You wanted them dead. The interrogation continues. You're part of a plot where two guys with guns and swords massacre his family and then burn his house to the ground. Was Aaron the mastermind? I, I probably added fuel to the fire. Your father deserves the truth. You gave the command. Just do it. Is that true? The shocking conclusion. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more of my exclusive interview with Aaron Caffey.